The Feudal Future Podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. I'm Joel Kotkin. And today we are going to try to tackle one of the thorniest issues in Western civilization, which is housing for real people. And to help us do that, we have a really fantastic panel. Uh, we have, first of all, Joel Farkas, who is CEO of uh, Fruition Communities, which is a developer that works with housing and infrastructure development in the Western United States and actually is doing work in our area here in Riverside County. Joel, welcome. Thank you. Uh, in addition, we have Carla Lopez del Rio, who is the deputy director of the Riverside Department of Housing and Workforce Solutions. Carla, welcome. Yes. And Wendell Cox, our esteemed demographer and uh, longtime collaborator, fellow at the Chapman University Center for Demographics and Policy and CEO of Demographia, which is a research firm that tracks housing costs around the world. Wendell, welcome back. Pleased to be here. Joel, you want to start us off? Yeah. Um, well, let me just start with uh, uh, Joel here, which is basically housing seems to be um, becoming out of reach for not just the poor, but really for middle class and even upper middle class people. Is there anything we can do to turn that around? Absolutely. We're, we're uh, the first and foremost thing is to recognize why it's so expensive. Uh, the common thread, the common comment is interest rates. Well, interest rates four years ago were low. They're high today. Housing was unaffordable four years ago. It's unaffordable today. Therefore, that's not the, that's not the cause. It's part of it. It's not the root cause. The root cause is two primary things. The kinds of approvals and jurisdictional regulations in local and state government. And one other thing that people are not aware of are the enormous fees, particularly in the Western mm -hmm. United States, a developer or homeowner has to pay to a municipal jurisdiction. The first easiest one to understand is water. The water fees, the cost of a water resource component for any home, no matter how little or how big, is beyond what everyone could, anyone could possibly believe. Uh, Wendell, you track this um, nationally and internationally. It, 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 would you agree with Joel that this sort of this is the underlying problem? Well, yeah, the, really, I think it's two points, the regulations in general and then the things like the taxation in California, the, the impact fees. I mean, I, last I saw, I think Fremont, the city of Fremont up in the Bay Area has an impact fee for a single family house of about $200,000. There are places in this country where you can buy a house for two hundred thousand, not a permit. So, but 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 for me, um, the real big problem is that much of the world has decided that we must not allow our cities to expand, we must not allow greenfield development, and this is what we're paying for. That it, it it is it is anti sprawl policies. Even the OECD, which supports these kinds of things is beginning to raise questions about whether anti-sprawl policies are doing the right thing because they're basically taking, they're basically in the process of ruining the middle class. Well, Carla, I've got a question for you because you experienced this from the client side, from the people who are actually trying to get affordable housing. How do you deal with it? When, it must be a very frustrating environment for you to not be able to serve a community of people that need the housing. How do you deal with it? Well, you have to be, number one, you have to be open-minded um, about what has been done in the past and what could be done in the future. And um, what I'm talking about is when you're trying to achieve home ownership, uh, you know, in any part in California, um, how engaged were you in the process of any housing stock coming out the pipeline? If you, if you look at who has the knowledge about how housing works, all of the things that you're saying about fee, land costs, lead time, um, all of those things are not really spoken about by the middle class or the working families. They really do not understand how the problem is affecting them. Mm. And so it's very difficult to drive public policies when the conversation is not coming from the resident. 
because they are ultimately the ones that drive how we in these positions of responsibility and fiduciary duty to the pa taxpayer dollars invest the money. And so if you do not understand how your money works, you'll never be able to own the destiny of that money or how you want it to move. And money can be, you know, manifested in housing, that's rentals or home ownership. And I honestly wish that there was more advocacy from the community so that they can show up and speak their desires rather than receive what's available. And that's what I feel is happening right now, that it is very complex. People do not understand the intricacies of how we've, we've made it so convoluted that they really don't understand how to make advocacy for themselves. So that's one thing on the public policy side. There's there's a real lack of civic, civic engagement and clarity and transparency about um, how housing happens. Um, also, under, oh, yeah. Well, I'm just going to, before you go further on this, I want to just get Joel Farkas's perspective on this. So what's your sense of this? Is is public education the solution to this problem, or it'll, it'll help help at least balm the problem in some way? What kinds of things are, are proactively going on in your world to try to address the issues that Carla is bringing up? I, I completely agree with Carla. I would add, though, in addition to public education, it's the municipal jurisdictional, uh, the, the, the mayors, the town managers, uh, council members, uh, their education, planning departments, because while they may say and they may want to provide reasonably priced housing, housing people can afford, many of the things that they are doing, maybe unknown to them, are causing the, the, the inability to provide housing people can afford. Uh, Carl also mentioned another thing. So, uh, so, so wait a minute. I just want to make sure I understand that correctly. So what the implication is that they're kind of overstimulating people's expectations? Well, I don't know that that's even that deep. I think it's just an unawareness, lack of awareness of what, what they are saying and doing and requiring and what the re repercussions are. It, it, yes, the public, as Carla mentioned, um, that's a lot more people. But in addition to that, I'm not dismissing that, but in addition to that, we, we spend at Fruition Communities, we spend a lot of time with mayors and council members and, and city managers and, and planning staff to describe when we ask for a certain thing with a regulation, here is the reason behind it, not just so we as a developer can get something. We, we show it to the very end when a consumer, the public, their, their constituents, what it means to them, what it means to them in terms of the quality of home. Is it going to be, you know, we hear a lot about uh, the solving affordability issues by having tiny homes, 200, 300 square foot homes. Well, that's not really good for anyone other than a, 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 you know, a young person starting out. It's not good for a family. When we describe that if we do certain things, you have a higher quality product, a lower cost product, higher quality, lower cost, meaning it's more affordable. If you only do a few little things here, there's a reason behind it as opposed, and that's the education of the jurisdictions who are making these decisions in addition to the public, as Carla mentioned, demanding they want a higher quality product. They don't, they want to own their home. That's another thing Carla mentioned, home ownership. We at Fruition Communities want people to own a home. Well, and this is kind of critical to achieving the middle class dream. Right? Yes. The middle class dream is being independent, being self-sufficient, and being able to be in control of your life. And it sounds as though, you know, to me, home ownership is absolutely pivotal for that. But I, I'd like to ask, you know, Wendell, you've been following this debate for years. Is there any signs, any places where there's been a pushback against these policies? Well, there was in Florida in 2012 when Governor uh, Rick Scott led the effort to basically take the state out of housing development. Uh, they had a, a so-called smart growth law that required all sorts of onerous regulations that had driven the house prices up. And the state legislature killed all that. Regrettably, not everywhere. Uh, you, that that took, took away the state problem, but the locals had already adopted a bunch of things. So, so um, you know, it wasn't nearly as effective as it should have been. But you think about, for example, California, which is the worst housing affordability problem in, in the United States. 
If you don't solve the problem at the state level, it hardly matters what you do at the local mm -hmm. level. That is to say, you got to work everywhere, but as long as seek exists and can be used as it is being used, the California that's, that's, Environmental Quality uh, yeah, okay. uh, Act, uh, as long as 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 uh, litigants could go into court and stop projects for twenty or thirty years, um, you you can't get anywhere. Those kind, the, the state regulations that combined with Senate Bill th um, uh, three twenty five from two thousand eight creates a situation where land costs are so high. You could have the best regulated community, city or county in the world, and you can't build housing that's affordable because the land costs are being driven by state policies that need to be changed. I call a, um, you know, we've been looking at this for a long time about the impact, particularly on emerging communities like, for instance, Hispanics here in California, you know, about half of all the young people in California are Hispanic. Um is there any consciousness? I mean, what I find astounding is you've got all these people representing Latino districts, but they don't do anything to address this issue. Why is that happening? This is a very personal opinion, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, Doesn't mean it's wrong. Take me, for example. Okay, I'm a first-generation college student. My network of people has been built from scratch. Like I, the people I know today were people that I met throughout my life. But then you have uh, colleagues of mine that come from several generations of college graduates and they are connected and they were born and raised into these connections of people that I was unaware of. So my background may be first at many things. And this is what's happening in California. You're having a lot of first generation politicians, first generation college grads. They, we come with talent and skill sets uh, that are in the in growing, but the mentorship and the understanding of how things work is really not coming from our parents. Uh, we wrote a NASA recently that talked about understanding Latinos in California. And although you have like, you know, all immigrants that have come to the United States, they come from poverty mostly. Um, they do not come as wealthy people. Very few people come with wealth and start businesses here. Most of the immigrants that have built this country and continue to build this country come from very poor backgrounds. So 77% of the Hispanics that live in California have a Mexican background from Mexico. So these 77% of people are coming from rural areas of Mexico where these concepts are absolutely outside of the scope of and They don't understand, not because they cannot understand, but because it doesn't exist, for example, a 30-year mortgage. That's a very complex financial tool that doesn't exist in a country of origin. You come to the state, you have very little, little uh, education, you've got, you face language barriers. And so you yourself have to overcome a lot of issues uh, and a lot of barriers in order for you to be able to know how to participate civically. In addition to having two or three jobs that are keeping you from participating in the nine to five uh, um, schedules that we in government usually um, operate. So there's a, there's an inability to participate and be educated and be aware. And then there's also a very important piece of the work that I think needs to re be recognized in that is the inability of parents to pass down knowledge, mm -hmm. both knowledge in understanding how to participate civically, how to lead, but also financially. They are not uh, children that will inherit assets. They are building them as they grow. So they're very stretched thin when it comes to being able to serve, being able to take care of their families, but most importantly, have that network, that mentorship, and that understanding of how they can actually not just lead better, but make changes that will uh, have a repercussion in their, in their community. So uh, in order to work on this, we really need to work on that mentorship, that um, you know, guiding people through the process, making them aware of how things work. It's not just about going to school. It's about understanding how things work and being connected, being able to affect. Um, but but so it also it also seems to me that the issue is not just educating people who are going to be the customers of, of affordable housing in terms of what their expectations are, but there seems to be a re-education that's required among policymakers about what it is that 
what it is that are at the core of their assumptions. I mean, for instance, Wendell, you mentioned CEQA, and I want to. I want to also. I want to get your thoughts on this and Joel's as well. Um, it strikes me that there is an underlying assumption that if we somehow lighten up on the review of environmental regulations that you know that we make the process easier we allow you know may, maybe we cap the no amount of times you can you can challenge us a, a CEQA filing you know or an environmental review um, that somehow we're going to be killing the environment and we're going to be creating a horrified you know uh, nightmare of uh, of uh, uh, biblical proportions for the environment and that's just simply not true and what's happening is people are using these loopholes to be able, or this this structure of the of the sequel laws, to be able to bollocks up projects. So, Joel, how do you deal with that? And because and, and, uh, you operate also in different states, and so maybe you also it's different. are involved at the infrastructure level, not just at the at the housing project level. How do you? What are you finding in terms of people's policymakers' attitudes and the whole environment around this regulatory? situation. Well, Marcia, Marcia you, hit the, you hit the nail right on the head. Um, if you're uh, going to be an, a planner in this country, the top 25 schools in the nation have some sort of title called urban planning. Uh, you're not going to get a suburban, rural, exurban planning degree. You're going to get an urban planning degree. The bias, basically, of policymakers and elected officials is the solution to reasonably priced, high-quality housing for families is an urban environment. All you have to do is look at the top 50 largest cities in the world and realize that's patently, absurdly untrue. They, the housing in those top 50 worldwide cities are not less expensive. They're not larger. They're not higher quality. Transportation cost is not better. Transportation um, uh, 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 problems, traffic problems is not worse is not better, the food costs are not better, energy costs are not better. There's nothing that's better for a family in an urban environment. Now, an urban environment has its place. It's just not for families. And the families are a substantial part of th th this. You're also not gonna find anybody that thinks they can have enough money in their 20s and 30s to buy a home in an urban environment. None, so it's so obviously true that while urban areas have certain benefits, it has no benefit for the people that we're talking about. So what you start with, and what I start with, is go to places outside of these environments where we absolutely can provide exactly what, what Joel and Wendell and Carla are talking about. They exist. There's more than 19,000 jurisdictions in the United States. There's 20 large urban areas. There's a lot of places to go where, where we can, ha th this is not an ho a hopeless conversation. We have the vast majority of people in this country who are buying new homes. I mean, Joel knows the data, Wendell knows the data, I'm sure they'll speak to it, want what we are talking about. And they, they are willing to go to the places that you can provide what we are talking about. And that's how you do it. It is not hopeless, we're doing it right now. It's just not, made a, 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 a prominent and they're not aware of, they being policymakers who will have authority, they're not aware of this. Well, and it sounds like policymakers who are not aware of it in California are a particular problem. And this is where I think we need to turn to Wendell to get yes. some facts. Wendell, um, who's doing it right? And, and, where, and where are people going? And, uh, and yeah, looking where for are housing. people going? First of all, what's happening not only in the U.S. but in Canada and other places is our cities. And by cities, I'm talking about the area that starts where the farm starts and goes all the way to where the skyscrapers are. People are moving to lower density areas in both Canada and the United States. In fact, at this point, the faster the over since the last census, which was not that long ago, 2020. The fastest growing parts of Canada and the United States are not even metropolitan. They have become small, urban, and rural. First time probably we've seen that ever, certainly in a hundred or more years in this country. So, so that that's uh, what's going on at this point. And, um, and by the way, uh, f fastest growing, uh, fastest growing county in California 
happens to be Riverside County in terms of population. Oh, yeah. So no question about it. So so what about well, they, this? They heard that Carla moved there, so they're all going. That's right. They, Carla, <laughs> Carla is the magnet. <laughs> but, but Wendell, uh, is it as simple as just lightening up on CEQA? Well, oh, no, there's much more to it. You have to recognize this is not something that's just California. The, the urban planners have been trying to do this since the 1850s. You can go back and read about how bad the suburbs were in the English urban books of the 1850s. And so th there is a philosophy that basically says we've got to densify. We don't like suburbs. We, we want these. We want cities to look a particular way. And the price we are paying for it is the destruction of the middle class as well as forcing people into poverty. Because when you've got to go join the public housing wait list because you can no longer afford the housing that your, your parents could have afforded, you're moving into poverty even though you may not be counted that way. And to, and to exclamation point on Wendell's comment, the uh, state of Colorado is looking at passing new legislation to deal with affordable housing crisis in Colorado. What is their basic premise? Transit-oriented development, which is higher density home housing along transit lines. I, I, it, regardless of whether that's a good idea or bad idea in general, it is not going to be uh, to solve any affordable housing issue whatsoever. It is documented. It's proven. It's insane. Now, why are they calling it, this legislation, um, a solution to housing aff affordability? Because everyone agrees that housing affordability is pretty important. Yet the solution has nothing to do with housing affordability. Yeah. And, and the transit right. issue is really a fascinating one that I know Wendell has spent most of his life researching. I'd love to get, I'd love for you to share some of the statistics that you've shared with me about the availability of jobs that come from uh, transit availability. So take it away. Well, uh, the thing about it, and I was on the LA County Transportation Commission um, when, when all this started in, 18, in 1980. Um, 1880. Yeah, 1880. <laughs> one of those two years. Anyway, we start. We we now in Los Angeles, and I live in St. Louis. By by the way, now and have for about 40 years. But uh, we now in Los Angeles have many rapid transit lines. Not rapid transit, but I mean, you know, light rail lines. We got some subways. We're going to get a lot more, and so on. And do you realize that the transit ridership in Los Angeles today? not today, in 2019, before the pandemic, was down 25% from where it was in 1985 when all we had was buses. Now, I can tell you, and I can't speak for anybody else who was on that commission, but I certainly did not support rail when I was on that commission, and I was a great supporter of it, on the assumption that in 40 years we were going to carry fewer people. We are spending hideously additional, uh, larger amounts of money than we did before, and we are serving fewer people. And you can go across the country and see the same thing. So, and, and the other thing that is my favorite thing, and Marsha was probably talking about, you look at how many jobs you can get to in this country in 30 minutes by transit. And, and that's about the average work trip travel time one way in this country. If you look at all the metropolitan, the 50 or so metropolitan areas, more than a million people, uh, the highest figure you can get to in terms of the number of jobs you can reach in 30 minutes by transit is about 3%. On average, in the United States, you can get to 60 times as many jobs by car as by transit in 30 minutes. Now, with that as background, you're absolutely right, Joel, uh, Joel Farkas. And, and that is that transit-oriented development, it, it may sound good, but it's not going to work, and it doesn't work anywhere. Yeah, if and you're I, living in Tokyo, it might work great. Oh, well, Tokyo, my goodness, when you've got 70% of the people on transit, uh, quite a different thing. That's one of the problems. I mean, one of, the, one of my great frustrations in being uh, on national transit committees was my colleagues often didn't realize that to have the the transit system of Hong Kong, you didn't just build it. You actually had to have the land use that justified it in the first place. And let me just comment for those who would say, well, that's exactly what we want. Uh, I don't <laughs> think anybody believes Tokyo is the bastion of 
reasonably priced housing for middle class Japanese. And of course, they also have a very low birth rate. And, and the same thing is true in, in, in Korea, in China, you know, in Beijing, in Shanghai, that if any place you have this, these policies, you have very low birth rates. And, and you know, Carla, yeah. you're, you're in Riverside. You're one of the few places where families are still moving. But I just wanted to uh, connect a little bit of a couple of thoughts that I've heard um, and, and respond to that. Um, I came from Mexico City. I'm an immigrant. I, I was I was born and raised in Mexico City. So I have had used public transportation because that is the way that the, the city was built. It was very centri- centered around public transportation. Um, there's there. If you were to survey me, though, of course, I use the public transportation. I've used it in, in San Francisco, in L.A. I've had the opportunity to live in those megapolis. But if you were to ask me and survey me, it's not it's not always pretty to be on public transportation. When you are feeling sick and trying to get home and you can't get off the bus and you need to use the restroom, it is horrible. When you are trying to get to an emergency to your family and you can't get to the, or you miss the bus or you miss the train, uh, you can't get to your kids. So is it, is the, the question is not just, is it efficient? Is, is it what people want? Mm-hmm. And that's the question that I continue to miss in every single one of these conversations is like, this regulation and that thing. And, and so I, I'm in it, I'm doing the work with you. This is exactly what I talk about every day, but this is not the conversation that is going to change. And so what I would like to point to is that what we need to do is we need to democratize knowledge. And the reason why, you know, these universities, and I had the privilege of going to one of those top universities that are leading a lot of this thinking is that I was sitting there thinking like this, they're not talking about me. I was a single mother, you know, in college and I, I, I was not in tune with what was being said. So what I think professors have, and believe me, I love academics. So I don't, I don't have anything against academia. What I have against academia is not their fault. It's, it's the fact that the conversation should not be their conversation. It should be our conversation, the people's conversation. And so holding on to that power and then making them that their input is going to have these effects on society and having our elected officials sometimes listening to academics more than residents is an issue. And that's why they continue to use the center, you know, thinking without anybody criticizing you, you will continue to do the same thing without knowing you're doing it wrong. That's why constructive criticism matters, and it should happen in the open democratic uh, lore. Yeah, although um, although I have to tell you, this is not an entirely new theme. The idea that academia is out of touch with reality is not just something that happens in the housing world. Right. Uh, we I'm in the business school, and you know I can't I can't tell you the number of situations where uh, my colleagues have no real world knowledge about what's actually going on in, in the business world, and are training students to think a certain way. I'm, I'm thinking back to your point, Joel, about. Um, teaching urban planning uh, and how the bias toward density is kind of an underpinning element of where of what you teach as good urban planning. I mean, I don't even know how do you how do you correct that? How do you create but suburban planning? You actually correct it the way Carla's talking about it. And actually, uh, well my my goal actually is for for people to say, I love developers as opposed to academics, but that'll never happen. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the way you correct it, it, it's nothing that, you know, in our company, we're not trying to teach anyone anything. We're actually, we listen to people just like Carla is describing. While they may not, people may not be able to articulate it the way all of us are saying it now here, instinctively, there's a lot of people in this country and in this world that know what they want. Carla alluded to it. When she was hearing some of these things, she said, they're not speaking to me. There's a lot, almost everyone I talk to that is a customer, a potential customer, says the same thing. They know what they want. And we listen to them. And we're simply providing what we hear that they want. So we don't, our, our, our job in fruition communities is not to teach um, either, um, you know, constituents or uh, the regulatory authorities something new. We go to where we can do it, and we provide what people tell us they want. 
And the best thing, the best way to expand what Carl is saying is to democratize this idea. The more people that physically own a home, the more people will learn on their own that this is important. You know, in Colorado, we have very expensive ski resorts, the Roaring Fork Valley in the Western Slope. Um, you, what are the two biggest employers? Are the school districts in the mountains or the hospitals in the mountains? Their solution, the, the, and please don't criticize my they argument, I know who they are, I just don't want to name them, um, is to provide uh, $1,500 rents for 200 square foot homes. Well, it sounds good when rents are three, four, five thousand, but it's six dollars a foot or more, seven dollars a foot. That is only for someone who's 22 or 23 years old. It's not for a skilled uh, teacher. It's not for a skilled person working in a hospital. That's the extent of density. Uh, some of the housing authorities have just announced in the Roaring Fork Valley a new affordable housing project. The cost, not the cost to the county and the city is $1.4 million per home. $1.4 million per home. And these are one and two bedroom and that's about it. These are not solutions. But these are extreme examples, or maybe not extreme. Maybe that's a typical example where people that we're talking about think they know the answer. The real answer is the people who think they know have, have failed. They have not provided affordable housing. That's a fact. So why are we listening to them? Right. I'm going to listen to people Carla says I should listen to that instinctively know. And, I, and, and during this process, when they own a home, they will have a bigger voice. And I want them to, I want them all the upside of their home, I want them to keep. And I want their voice to get louder. Well, and the market mechanism the way, for, uh, for this would normally be elective politics. And it strikes me that most of the people that are in the policymaking role in government are actually appointed rather than elected. And unfortunately, these people are too smart to become elected uh, officials. So yeah. they, they, have the, they have jobs. Well, like, by the way, <laughs> go, when, yeah, go. and by the way uh, recognize that the, the people, in fact, are voting with their feet. Yeah, we yeah, now have yeah. a state in California that, that 20 years ago, the State Department of Finance said the state of California will have 60 million people, 60 million by 2050. Now, California will have 40 million by 2050. And you know how many it has now? 40 million. No growth. We have seen a net three and one half million people move out of the state of California to other states. Now, why are they doing that? One, they can't afford to live there anymore. I think a lot of people are not happy with the idea of having an apartment and being expected to raise a family there, etc. California has a real problem here, and I don't think it's really recognized by a lot of people. Can I add? Um, I wanted to finish the question that Joel asked me. First. I'm sorry, but you asked about people coming to Riverside County. And so um, I wanted to just... Um, Yes, there are a lot of people coming to Riverside County. This is still the most affordable place, uh, am among the most affordable places where you can still create some type of home ownership or affordable housing. However, um, <coughs> the relationship between inland California and Sacramento, it's, it's noticeable that it's not very strong. And so when you are talking about you really want to focus on those areas that have the potential, you would then think that this that the resources would follow that urgency and mm -hmm. that strategy yeah. and so you're finding a lot of these communities that are low income or you know uh, not have not been given the opportunity to grow because of the lack of relationship it's a relationship thing and so when um you're trying to develop housing in, in riverside county you find places that are affordable but are lacking things like infrastructure that are free cursors to actual being able to develop and those investments need to come before there's real there's a reality for you to be able to produce housing um so the relationship between sacramento and the regions that are affordable in the inland areas must be stronger and there are some signs that uh, california is listening because i can tell you that today 
in my experience, recent experience, um, the governor's office assigned, um, <coughs> rep- I'm sorry, uh, the governor's office assigned specific representatives to regions like the Inland Empire, where in the past they, those positions did not exist. And they are actively coming to recruit uh, people who are first generation like myself and then inviting us to be part of commissions and boards, which had not happened before. And they are coming to have meetings with us in, in the neighborhood that can yield those relationships and that leadership. So I do think that we shouldn't be losing hope as you know, Joe Farkas was saying, this is, not a, uh, this is not a sad conversation. This is just a conversation where we're all frustrated and we all wanna find a solution, but we are all still trying very hard to not allow this period of our history where we are still experimenting how this capitalism thing works um, it's still very new. And, you know, we need to expect that in, in the continuous process of improving our country, we are going to find times where this will be a learning opportunity about the importance of our civic engagement and all the things we're talking about. But we are on our way to changing things for the better. For the future generations, this is not the end for them. Well, I think, you know, that's that's a little bit of optimism, which is great to have. Um, and obviously you think that the public engagement is the, the priority. Um, just to, to round out everything up, Wendell, what is um, what do you think would be your number one priority in terms of addressing the housing crisis? And then we'll give Joel the last word. Okay. Well, let's talk California because that's what we've been talking about. It. The number one thing that ought to happen right now is the, is the inland parts of California ought to be largely made exempt from these housing from these housing regulations. We've recommended this in a couple of surveys at this point, but housing affordability in places like Riverside County and and Stanislaus County and Fresno County is not good. It's as bad as Portland, but it's a hell of a lot better than Oregon and Washington uh, than, than Oregon and Washington and the coast. And so, if we could come in now and say, okay, you know what? Now we're going to allow development to occur in the San Joaquin Valley, the Sacramento Valley and the Inland Empire, and we're not going to ask any questions except to do to make sure you do it well, we could maybe turn around California. That's got to happen. Other than that, if you keep on with these laws, there's no way to go. You can't, it, it, there isn't any amount of talking that's going to help until someone's prepared to change the laws that have created this mess. Well, and, and so I think uh, this policy change also might be applicable to Eastern Washington East and Oregon. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, lots of Colorado. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Joel, you got the last word. How are you going to save us? Uh, I agree with what Wendell said. I want to add to that. Um, home ownership. You get one thing: home ownership. What does that mean? We, we we've we've bashed policymakers, academics, and developers. We haven't yet gone to the investment community who loves rental, tenement. Uh, dominant type of housing. Uh, I am for individual home ownership. And that is every other policy we've talked about. If it does not include that, we will end up with a structure in this country, which we're headed to, supported by those who want rental income, along with policymakers who want density and government housing supported control of rental income. And the individual that Carla has mentioned throughout this time has been the democratization of the individual, which includes primarily home ownership. It is family intergenerational wealth, along with autonomy, along with family formation. Well, and I think this is uh, there. This seems very plain to us that if we want to preserve the middle class, if we want to avoid a feudal future. Home ownership is the key to, to maintaining the middle class, and there are obvious answers to solve the problem that are right in front of us. This is not a solution without a problem. So, Joel, Carla, and Wendell, thank you for being part of the Feudal Future, Feudal Future podcast, and we look forward to having you back to talk about this in more depth in a later show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The feudal feud.
future.